everyone. Welcome to day 22 of my at-home workout for social distancing. Um, there is a huge line of people outside my balcony looking down. Uh, they're giving away like bags of rice um, and people are coming from everywhere apparently. Uh, and so if you hear a little bit of a commotion, um, there are people lined up down there um, to get kilo bags of rice, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, in Thailand, there's quite a bit of people doing kind of um, individual, in Thai they call it tambun, which is a little bit like charity, um, but it's taking care of the community, so there will be these restaurants or individuals who will cook like, you know, 200, 500 meals or something and just hand them out to people um, at a table and they'll post online uh, where it's going to be at what time so that the entire community knows where to go and get it, which is really cool. So that's uh, happening right now outside my balcony. Um, I'm doing something a little different today, so if you guys have been following me um, in the past 21 days, uh, I'm going to stay with my uh, 500 elbows. I'm not going to do the knees today. Uh, I'm going to keep with the elbows, and the reason I'm keeping with the elbows is that um, I have talked to a friend, uh, he's also a sponsor, Kyle of Chikara Martial Arts in Australia, and um, the thing about gyms is that they are communities. Like we. In the same way that if you can't literally go to your church, you can't literally go to your temple, you're still part of that community, uh, even if you can't go into that space. And I think that uh, gyms are very much the same way. Like, those are our families, those are our communities. Um, and so even though we can't be in our gyms right now, uh, we are still part of that community. And I think that keeping in touch with those people and keeping uh, kind of united in our efforts with those people means a lot. Um, so. We were talking to Kyle while we were driving down uh, from Chiang Mai to Pattaya, um, which was like two weeks ago, um, and we were talking to him about his whole gym and me doing these 500 elbows every day. Um, not necessarily that number, but just doing high repetition. So I'm going to keep with that because to me, having something that you're doing every day that's like, if nothing else, there's that one thing, um, that keeps me sane <laughs> in, in some ways, um, and it's meaningful to me. Um, and back when I was doing um, a thousand elbows a day, which was probably one or two years ago, just trying to get my elbows going so that I could feel them, in order to get a thousand elbows every day, I had to do them in kind of insane ways. Like we would be traveling for my fights, and in order to get them every day, I would be doing them at gas stations that we stopped at on our drive down from Chiang Mai. I'd be doing them in the car with my like seatbelt on, just like trying to get, like trying to get them going. Um, it's easier for me now to like bust out a hundred of them, um, but it's uh, important to me now that in keeping it a number that's reasonable for me to do every day, that I'm really being mindful of those elbows while I'm doing them. So um, something, if you've been listening to these at-home workouts or, or joining me in these at-home workouts, something I've really been <laughs> hammering into you guys is how important it is to be um, using this opportunity to be like mindful of feeling all of the different things that you can feel when you're doing things, even if it's just footwork, even if it's just throwing a one-two as you march across your living room, whatever it is, just like feel it, become more aware of feeling things in your body. Um, so I'm going to keep the 500 elbows and I'm going to do some like weights and stuff. I'm just going to do a little bit of a like workout at home. Um, the thing about these videos is that I am just doing my own workout. <laughs> like I'm not, not designing something for other people and I'm not telling you what to do. I don't tell people what to do. Um, you can join me. That would be awesome if you did. If you have your own ideas, do your own thing. If you guys have questions about whatever, you can ask them on the stream. We're kind of hanging out. Um, it's like we're just chatting and seeing what's going on like while I'm doing my workout. Usually I'm talking about technique because that's what I'm doing in these at-home workouts. Um, I don't have a lot of ideas about technique of like weightlifting and things like this, um, but I might blather a little bit about why I'm doing that exercise over another one or um, kind of how important strength is based on what a lot of the legends and crews I've trained with have talked about. Um, I think that one of the things about conditioning that's really important to me is that it has been said over and over and over again by these legends and crews that if you do not have strength and stamina, you will never be able to access whatever technique you've perfected. So you could be like the most technical, amazing, perfect, beautiful Muay Thai, but if you don't have the um, running, like if you haven't done your running, 
if you don't have the endurance and you don't have the strength, you can't access those techniques. At the same time, uh, if you are super strong and you don't have any technique, you're going to use up all of your energy and you're going to use up all of your strength. You're going to burn your arms because you don't have the technique to make it so that you don't have to reach into that barrel that often. So the two work together really, really closely um, in the same way that if you look at golden age fighters, their offense and their defense is just this beautiful flow of going back and forth and like it's not an on and off switch. That's the same thing that I've heard many, many times from the legends and crews is that you need your strength and endurance and your technique to grow together. Like they need to be part of one thing. So today I'm going to do um, strength, <laughs> strength training today. Um, I'm going to look and see if anyone has asked any questions so far. Um, and then I'm going to do uh, my elbows kind of in between doing whatever weights and exercises I'm going to be doing. I'm kind of making those up as I go um, just because I haven't really planned it out. I don't, I love Andy Thompson. He was my mentor when I first moved to Thailand. He had this book where he would like write down how many reps he'd done of everything every day because he wanted to track his progress. I'm not one of these people. <laughs> I don't write things down and see how many I've done. I see how I feel based on like, mm, it was easier to do that two days ago and now it's hard kind of thing. Um, so I'm just going to kind of like flow with it today. So as I disappear back here, it's because I'm looking on the screen. Mitch says hi. Hi, Mitch. Uh, Krumsock is watching. Krumsock is awesome. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with Krumsock, he teaches in um, France now for probably like 10, 15, 20 years, something like that. Uh, but Krumsock beat Sagat three times um, and he fought Diesel Noy twice. He was actually um, two of the last fights that Diesel Noy had. Um, or in the last four fights that he had, he had a draw. Uh, Diesel Noy and Kronksak had a draw, and then uh, Diesel Noy won the second one. But uh, Kronksak just has this incredible kind of like power. Speaking of power, he has this like power feeling to him, but all of his technique allows him to not have to access that power all the time. He's in the Muay Thai library if you want to watch his session. Um, I trained with him at the uh, Warrior Gym here in Patia when he was visiting. Um, I think he visits Thailand maybe once a year from France, but super, super charming guy, um, really sweet. And we showed him the 123 all-time greatest Thai fighters that he was in there. When we opened the book and I wanted him to sign it, I'm like, can you sign this page? He was so shocked and in love with this picture that he was in and among the 123 all-time greatest Thai fighters. He just had to like keep looking through the book. Like he didn't sign it for like 10 minutes. He wanted to look through the book. It was really sweet. Um, he's very, very humble, uh, but very, very beautiful um, in his style and what he does. I really like it. So I've got just some weights that I have at home from when I injured my shoulder, so I'm going to see what I can do with those.
one thing worth mentioning. Um, something that all TIE fighters will tell you is how important it is to have a strong core. Doesn't matter what style fighter you are, you want to have like a really, really strong core. Diesel Noy talks about it a lot. <laughs> and uh, there was one time that we were, Kevin and I were driving up to Chiang Mai. This was incredible. We had Diesel Noy and Karahat with us on this road trip driving up to Chiang Mai and they were both really excited as we were like pulling into the city in the dark because there was this really big card going on um, in Karat at the time, maybe in Buriram, I think it was in Buriram. But they were all excited and they were like uh, taking a piss out of each other about, they were on opposite sides of who they thought was going to win in these different fights and things, but um, there was someone fighting, I won't name names, there was someone fighting who had been Yodmoy the year before, like he had been named fighter of the year previously, and uh, he was in a rematch, and he got fucking killed in his rematch by body shots, and the disdain with which Karahat was like, as Yodmoy, you cannot lose to body shots because it means that you have a weak core. Like basically uh, your stamina and your like conditioning and training was not up to par, and this is not what a Yodmoy is. So it means that your conditioning and like your physique and your kind of strength we think of Yodmoy, I think, in the West as being like super technical, like it's all technical, but they're also just fucking invincible. If you watch the Diesel Noy versus Samart fight, those are Yodmoy. That's Yodmoy versus Yodmoy. And Diesel Noy was exhausted in that fight. He had cut an incredible amount of weight, like stupid amount of weight in a short amount of time. Um, and he does not look tired in that fight. It's crazy because he talks in our interview with him about how tired he was. And if you think about it, you're like, he must be exhausted, but he doesn't show it. And that takes the kind of training that he did to be able to do that. The reason I'm talking about core strength is that after my push-ups, I was doing kind of like a mountain climber kind of thing with my knees. Um, if you hate sit-ups, which I do, or if you um, are in a very sweaty, hot place like Thailand and you're doing a lot of sit-ups, you, like me, might peel the skin off of your tailbone eventually from it rubbing against your uh, shorts. This is incredibly painful. Do not keep doing sit-ups when you have this. I think I've seen this actually on like CrossFit forums. They, they have like a name for it when you've like rubbed the skin off of your tailbone from too many sit-ups. So if you can't do sit-ups, these are also a really good alternative to keep working on your uh, core strength but not having to do um, the same type of like traditional sit-ups. I'll do an S of those. disappear behind the camera real quick and see if there's any questions, comments. Hannah Moon. I dislocated my shoulder twice. I've dislocated my shoulder. It is painful. Uh, okay, so Hannah says, as you're doing strength, would love shoulder strengthening techniques very new and find body shots crunch my shoulders so would love tips on strength and mobility particularly for that strike um hannah i assume that what you're saying is that when when you throw a body shot it's crunching your shoulder like it's hurting you on your on your punch um <laughs> I was hitting Kevin the other day. <laughs> I, was, I was doing body hooks the other day like this, um, and I crunched my shoulder. And uh, I've now injured both of my shoulders, but this one was hurt for quite a long time. Um, there are a couple of things I can say about shoulders. Um, one, protect your rotator cuff as much as you possibly can, even when you're not hurt. If you're hurt on one side, start protecting the other side immediately. Um, a really good thing to do is have a, a light, a very lightweight, 
Alright, so this is like, this is like two pounds. You can do something like this, or you can even just have like a band, like a stretchy band. But you want to tuck your elbow into your body, and basically just do this. Kind of open it up, you'll feel it, um, you'll feel it in the back of your shoulder here, like this. That's strengthening your rotator cuff. Make sure you do it on both sides. If you're, if you're injured on one side, be very delicate with that on, um, while you're working with that. Uh, if your shoulder is dislocating, um, I've had slippage in my joints. Um, and something that's really, really, really helpful for me is um, holding a weight. It's actually why I bought these. These are five kilos. Um, and so this one was injured. If you have something you can lay on and let your arm dangle, awesome. If you don't, my couch is not high enough, my bed's not high enough, I can't let my arm dangle. You basically are just gonna, um, so if this one was, was hurt, I'm basically just gonna bend at the waist like this so that the arm can dangle with the weight on it, and I'm just gonna let it, let it find its own natural position. It likes to be like this. And you'll feel your shoulder actually kind of like slide a little bit, and you can do very gentle rotation on your hand to like feel, I can feel this is like clicking a little bit, like it's trying to find a position. A heavier weight would be nice, like a 15, 20 pound weight works, but if you only have a light one, you can do this too. And you're basically just like letting your shoulder relax. Similar to that is hanging. I'm a huge proponent of hanging. If you have no shoulder injuries, start hanging already because this will protect your shoulders in a crazy way. If you have shoulder injuries, this will be, I swear to God, it's like a miracle, miracle, <laughs> miracle cure. Um, just hang. Like, you want your hands facing uh, forward, kind of close together, just uh, shoulder width apart. You're just going to grip a bar and then just let your body go. So you want to be off the ground if you can, kick your feet up or whatever. But you're just going to use body weight and hang for like 10, 20, 30 seconds at a time if you can. I try to do 10 minutes of hanging at 30 seconds at a time, so I have to hang 20 times. This is to protect my shoulders. It's, I cannot tell you, it made such a huge difference. It took this shoulder quite a long time to heal since I injured it last May, but if I had not been hanging, it would still be a nightmare right now. I'm completely sure of it. So, um, rotator cuff, uh, anything that's kind of like this but not coming too high, above your shoulders just for like strengthening stuff kind of like this do lightweight um but like reps to kind of just build up the muscles around that and then hang to like bring the um bring the stretching into you have like a, a tendon that goes like this and then there's like a little bone like that that the bone actually it's crazy the bone actually can change shape by hanging um there are books about this uh, so hanging is, is really, really good. I recommend that. And take care of your shoulder. In terms of uh, like it hurting when you're hooking, that's because of where your shoulder is when you're hooking. If you let your arm flay out too much and you're going like this, that's why you're jamming your shoulder is that your elbow is kind of um, leaving your body too much. That's what happens with me. When I come and I go like this, I'm going to jam my shoulder real bad. If I tuck my elbow close to my body and let the entire thing come as one piece, it doesn't hurt and it kind of comes like up more, like this. The way to keep it tucked is to pay attention to the elbow being close to the ribs, but for me, the opposite side is what makes this all be one side. So if I go like this and keep this on my head, that's gonna protect my entire, it's gonna protect my entire hook. If I let this one float, my arm automatically comes out. So this side is what I concentrate on and it actually fixes that side for me, which is cool. So, uh, Machi says, uh, any overall tips for efficient regeneration? I feel like I can't quite recover properly. Sleep's there, food's there. What the heck? Oh. <laughs> All right. Kevin and I uh, are proponents of the ketogenic diet, so we keep our carbs really, really low. We eat a lot of fat, um, moderate protein, very, very low carb. And on top of that, we do something that uh, we call one plus one keto, 
which means that we fast every other day. So we're actually only eating every other day. Uh, so we fast for 32, 34 hours between, and then on days that we are eating, we're eating for ketogenesis. Um, this sounds insane, but <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, we have found really, really good things with it. My recovery with it is really good because you enter into autophagy, which is where your body is basically doing like a cell cleanup uh, when you're fasting. So even if you don't go all the way into one plus one keto, even if you're not fasting every other day, I think that if you decide to do like um, intermittent fasting or if you do the like eating windows that people talk about, just giving your body time to reset with fasting, this will be much easier and much more efficient if you also keep everything really low carb. Uh, Kevin for a while was eating every other day to lose weight, but on days that he was eating, he would just eat whatever he wanted, which at the time happened to be incredibly high carb. Um, and it's just slamming your body with a lot of inflammation and then giving it time to recover from that. But um, the way that we eat now of um, keeping in ketosis and having fasting in between, I feel like my recovery is just like very, very fast. I still get sore um, a lot <laughs> and I still um, have small injuries and things like this, but my recovery time I can feel is much better. Um, you also need to be really conscious of your electrolytes. Um, that's whether you're doing ketosis or not, but if you're eating for ketosis, be super diligent about your uh, electrolytes because you shed salt pretty easily when you're in ketosis. Um, but everyone should be paying attention to their electrolytes. This is a huge thing, and I think that it's a very mis... Uh, non-emphasized, and I think a lot of people have the deficiencies um, that we're just not really aware of. So even just adding salt and uh, potassium and magnesium to your diet in general, that might help with your uh, recovery much better as is. Um, but active recovery is really important too. So sleep is good. You're like, sleep is there, food is there. Um, if you can do like saunas or hot baths and ice baths and things like that, I think that those are really good for you too. Um, hot to me is actually way more useful than cold, but uh, the cold feels really good after you, <laughs> sorry to spit everywhere. After you do like a, like a hot sauna, it feels really good to go in the ice baths too. Sorry, there are more questions. I'm gonna check those. Uh, so Aaron says, I have bad asthma, which prevents me from training, conditioning, such as running, when it's bad. Do you have any tips on what I can do instead, like a low-intensity conditioning exercise? I skip rope. That works okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's going to depend largely on you, because it's your, your asthma, so you see uh, what triggers it and what doesn't. Um, it's possible that for someone like you having kind of more of a, a hit situation where you're like doing some super high intensity and then pulling it back down so it doesn't trigger, I don't know a lot about asthma, so it doesn't trigger it. Um, swimming, uh, to me, is incredibly uh, endurance building because <laughs> one, I'm not very good at it, but two, it just works your entire body and you have to control your breathing while you're doing it. Um, you have to have access to a pool to do something like that, but skipping rope is really good. Um, jumping on a tire is really good. Um, and I don't know anything that like really, really gets your heart up, um, that you can do without triggering your asthma too badly is something that's going to be beneficial for you. It doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't have to be a, like, if you can't run row kind of thing, it's like, if you can't run, do literally anything else that gets your heart rate up like that so that you can train it. Um, my heart goes up pretty high when I'm doing like 8 million knees. So you could do a lot of knees.
I'm gonna try to work on this front part right here because for clinching, this gets sore really fast. Um, you can burn yourself out. So being strong here for me in the clinch um, is a big deal from my experience. Just trying to feel that kind of in this front part. The thing about um, the thing about clinch for me is I'm very lucky in that I'm very naturally strong for my size. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't like to go hardcore. I'm like it's just genetic because I, <laughs> I have no idea. But even since I was a kid, if I do like ten push-ups, I just get swole out of nowhere. Like I build muscle really easily. Um, it's just a, a body type kind of thing. Um, but I've noticed that uh, when I start doing something, like when I start hitting heavier bags, my muscles got bigger. When I start clinching a lot, when I moved to Petron Room, my muscles got really big and my neck swole. Um, and so it's just like whatever muscles are being engaged on me become really physical, physically evident. Um, and so that to me taught me which muscles I'm using when I'm doing things. So because I kind of got like stacked out this way and my neck got really big, it was clear which muscles I was using when I was clinching. Um, and to me, this like this front part here is really important because that's how you kind of like stay tight and hold somebody. So if I'm trying to hold someone's neck with my elbow pushed in here, I kind of want to keep this position really strong. And I can feel that that comes from here, like keeping this so that someone can't wiggle their way out so that I have the ability to hold something here. That comes from here. And then doing like pull-ups and kind of like um, this kind of thing to be able to like wrench the head down um, are things that I've kind of focused on for clinch. Uh, Ivan Perez says, hope to see you fighting soon after this. Me too. I miss fighting like crazy. Uh, Good vibes from California. Thank you, Ivan. My almost entire extended family is in California. Kevin's mom is in California. Constantina, hello. Uh, Constantina is the sister of Fanny, who some of you might know as an amazing female Muay Thai fighter from Greece. Um, oh, good. How do you like my answer? All right. I'm going to do another set of those. So I'm, I'm coming from two positions. So this is like a, the way you would hold a hammer, comes straight down like this, and then I have them touch, and then I turn them so it's kind of like rowing a boat. And going like that, and so I count that as one, two, three, show you guys something that I actually <laughs> don't do but used to do and maybe should start doing now because I'm not clinching um, 
A lot of people ask questions about how to condition for particular things. Their favorite question is how to condition your shins, as if there's a like bashing your leg with like a bottle or a stick that's going to condition your shins. Don't mess with it. Honestly, just do the thing that you're trying to condition for. Uh, so kick a lot, kick pads, kick harder pads, kick bags, kick bigger bags, all of these things. That'll condition your shins. Um, if you want to have strong punches, hit a heavy bag a lot kind of thing. So um, when I first moved down to Petrungrung and was doing uh, more clinching than I'd ever done in my life, I was really diligent about strengthening my, my neck. I was doing the like holding uh, the weight in your mouth on the string and doing a lot of these. I did those up at Lana before I ever got a lot of clinch training as well to have a strong neck and a strong jaw. This is good. Um, then I started clinching like <laughs> hours at a time and felt like I didn't really need to do the neck strengthening as much anymore because I was kind of getting it in the actual battlefield <laughs> of clinching. Um, but I highly recommend as we come out of our caves and we start coming to Thailand again and going back to our gyms again, um, strengthening your neck before getting into the gym in Thailand where you're going to be doing a lot of clinching. If you start doing this now and then you come to Thailand in six months and you've got a strong neck, you are like way ahead of the game. Do not wait until you're like already clinching 20 minutes and your neck is jelly. So something that you can do easily at home, you can do this on the end of your bed uh, or you could do it flat on the floor. Um, it actually doesn't have to have the like negative incline, but just yes, no's and maybes is what they're called. It's a neck exercise and I'll show you what it looks like. So you can do this flat on the ground or you can do this with your head like hanging off of something. But so, yes is this. No is this. And then maybe is like this. All right, and then you wanna pop over and do it on the opposite side. So then you go, yes. No. And maybe. All right, so you can do those anywhere and you can start doing them now and then you'll have an awesome strong neck for when you actually get to start clinching with people and playing with people. And I felt and heard so much crunching in my neck just now when I was doing that that it has told me two things. One, I have been very bad about not doing my, um, I have like a, a cervical hammock, so it basically holds my head and hangs from above and I kind of like relax into it to kind of pull my neck up. Um, I should be doing that. And two, I probably should be doing more neck strengthening exercises because I'm not clinching right now so that when I'm able to go back to clinching, I don't have jelly neck super hard for like two days, which can and will happen. avoid wrist injuries when you throw uppercuts on the heavy bag. Mm, if you're if you're injuring your wrist on any punch, whether it's the uppercut, the hook, jab, cross, whatever, it's because of your wrist position. So, um, <laughs> how do I answer this? Um, yesterday I was talking about Sifu. Sifu McGinnis is here in Pattaya. He's at WKO. Uh, he has a long history of martial arts that includes Muay Thai, and so he has a lot of different influences. It's not only Muay Thai, but he's brilliant at teaching Muay Thai and, and was here in the Golden Age and very close with the Sidya Dong uh, gym, training some of their fighters in boxing back in the day. Um, Sifu introduced me to the concept of bare fist training, which I think comes from karate, but could possibly come from Shaolin. I don't know. I'm not a historian of martial arts. but. Sifu talked about the reason you, you train bare fist is because you can't, if you put a big bulbous glove around your fist and you punch with it, you can't actually feel a lot, like you've numbed your fist. And so if you hit wrong, you don't feel exactly where that was wrong. This totally ties into how I've been babbling at you guys about like using this time to really feel everything. So I started hitting bare fist. So I, I would hit the bag bare fist 
um, and I hit the bag hard, bare fist, so that you can feel exactly where you're landing. And then, because you're also having repeated impact, you are building muscles and structures in all the like tiny little pieces of your hand that will help support it. It's the same concept of like if you have um, like one of those Cybex machines, so that like everything's on a rail that you're doing weights like this. Versus if you're doing free weights, there are going to be like tiny micro adjustments and like you're right-handed so your right arm does more work and your left arm has to kind of like pick up the slack. That's kind of what's happening um, with bare fist training. So um, you could do a little bit of bare fist training, do it slow and do it lighter so that you don't jam your wrist right away, but like just start feeling where your your wrist is bending in the wrong direction or where you're clipping wrong when you're doing an uppercut. If you're hurting your wrist on the uppercut, it means that you're not like hitting in the right direction or your wrist is kind of like bending one way or another. Um, so if you do that slow and a little bit um, controlled and then you can start building it up, you'll feel where those differences are. Um, but other than that, it's very, very likely that you're either over turning your wrist like this or you're overextending it that way, um, and then it's just kind of like jamming. So you want to, on an uppercut, just just slightly like pull it towards yourself like this, but not a whole, you don't want it like this. Uh, just very, very little. I hit myself in the face on uppercuts. <laughs> That's my problem. <laughs> I hit myself like this. So I, um, I've had problems in the past with uh, doing uppercuts against pad holders who would be like batting down on me and it would crush my wrist. Um, that has since stopped. Uh, and I think it's because my uppercuts are actually a little bit longer now. If you're coming too straight up, it's easy to, to crush it. Whereas if you kind of have this longer thing like this, Sagat was really big about like my uppercut being longer. It's his whole like tiger uppercut thing like that. Um, so maybe try making it stand a little bit farther back from the bag too and see if you can get a little bit of a longer uppercut as well. Um, if you're over if you're overturning yourself and throwing uppercuts like this, that's how you jam your shoulder too when you're trying to do a body shot. If you're overturning on it, you don't have as much control of the trajectory of your uppercut. So try to like um, focus on keeping your elbow close to your body and maybe it can be a little bit longer like that. But just try stuff because I actually have no idea <laughs> why you're jamming your wrist. So play around with it and see in slow motion and with less um, impact where you don't jam your wrist and then try to like move it towards that. You have to learn how to like self-diagnose on things. Thank you, Fritz, says I had given good advice on uppercuts. Thank you. Fritz knows a little something about bare fist training. That's good as well. All right. So I'm going to get a little bit on the back here too. I've actually never done this with this weight. <laughs> It remains to be seen whether I can. You guys will see in real time whether or not I'm able to do the thing that I'm intending to do right now. with that. So 
brother John, who now is a sports psychologist, um, he was like a personal, maybe still is a personal trainer. Um, he was always my trainer. <laughs> like, when I was in middle school and high school, uh, he would make me get in his Jeep and we would go and work out together at the fitness gym that my dad's work had or something. Um, I basically just did it to spend time with my brother. I was like not super into the workout itself, but the advice he gave me at the time was that if you can do uh, more than 12 of something without the last few being hard, your weight is too low. So I tend to try to get my reps to about 12 or 15, and the last few should be really hard, and then I know that that's a good weight for me. These are the only weights I have in my apartment, so if it were the case that this was too light for me, like when I was, when I was doing the one here, which I thought was gonna be too heavy for me, um, if that had ended up being too light, just way up the reps. So basically like do it until it starts getting sore, and then count from there, <laughs> I guess, is the way that I would address that if, you're, uh, if your weights are too low for you to get to the um, sweet spot of 12 being difficult. But don't mess up your form. The form is important because you can um, I don't know, pull something or damage yourself in some way by doing weight at the wrong positions. shin conditioning, from my own experience, I found that kicking lower on the banana bags tend to work, being that they're usually quite a bit denser. Yes, sir. For sure. Uh, because of the way bags are filled, if there's anything other than cloth in them, and even if it's cloth that, like, settles in and just gets heavy over time, gravity, everything moves to the bottom. So the bottom of a bag generally is much harder than higher up where you go. Um, work your way up to it, I guess. I was, <laughs> I was crazy surprised, and I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have been, but when we had the Moikau Summit at my gym uh, here in Patia at Petron Room, we had legends coming in who, yes, they have not been training in gyms for decades, so they're not like, they still don't have the calluses they had when they were fighters. <laughs> Uh, Karahat was like kicking our bags and he was like rubbing his shins and he's like, oh, your bags are really hard here. And I was just like, aren't you Karahat? Like, what? why do you think our bags are too hard? But it is totally the like, um, you can lose your calluses. So who knows when I go try to kick something really hard, whether I'll uh, feel differently now after a, a month of training at home and not really having contact with things like that. But uh, yeah, like, like building up and like, like anything, conditioning is like a cumulative doing something in incremental increase kind of thing.
right. Thank you, Brits. Yeah. I should I, I should mention I am not often lifting weights. I'm not really a like weight lifting uh fighter. I do lift weights a little bit. Uh, what I've been telling you is what I understand about weightlifting, and it's generally the kind of weightlifting I do when I have um, time to be doing conditioning like this. I am not a like weights every day, heavy every day, building muscle. Um, most of the muscle that you see is coming from hours of clinching, hitting the bag, pad work, sparring, all of that stuff is mainly why I look the way that I do. Um, there is a little bit of weightlifting that I do for like protective reasons. When I was talking about um, how to build muscle around the shoulder, the hanging, using the weight like this, I do try to do a little bit of light weight lifting in order to do kind of protective things. I might do a little bit of squats and things like that in order to try to build my legs because they just don't build very well from running. Um, but in general, I use weights as like a supplement rather than weights being something that's like super important or integral into the training that I'm that I'm generally doing. Um, this might be different for other people. There might be some people for whom the cross training of weights really makes them feel strong or they can tell um, there's a lot of difference in the power that they have on pads or on the bag when they've been doing their weightlifting and stuff like this. Just pay attention to what that is. Like, um, I can tell that when I'm doing push-ups, like if I'm doing a lot of push-ups um, and pull-ups, I can feel that the fatigue I have in clinching is just, it's still there. But it's more manageable, like I feel like I'm not using that strength um, as much scraping the bottom of the barrel if I am doing my push-ups and pull-ups. So I'll get lazy about it sometimes and I like don't want to do them, so I'll kind of like pare them way down and uh, I suffer for it, so I, I end up pulling them back in. Um, but if you don't have weights at home, push-ups are amazing like push-ups will do a lot for you um, and you can do uh, kind of presses with anything slightly heavy in your room like if you if you just have kind of a heavier object <laughs> microwave or something you could totally you could totally be benching some microwaves or something So, I'm going to finish up with just a little bit of abs, again, to emphasize I have never, ever had any trainer of mine <laughs> not talk about how important it is to do like a gajillion sit-ups um, or have strong core. The reason you want to have a strong core is not only so that you look better in Muay Thai shorts, um, but because everything comes from the core, like, like in, um, in everything coming from the hips or the twist or something like this, like being really solid to be able to keep your root, uh, which is the Thai word for like, a, like an image or an outline of something, so like to be able to keep your posture, basically, um, being really strong in the center is really important. So working on your abs, if you're like me and you really hate doing sit-ups and stuff like that, instead of thinking about it of like, oh, I gotta get that six pack or whatever the thing is, because that doesn't really motivate me. What motivates me is like, this is gonna allow me to keep my root. Like, this is gonna allow me to stay upright when someone like nails me and is like, yeah, I didn't move at all. Um, we were watching the first Ali versus Frazier. <laughs> Frazier's hitting Ali really hard. Like, <laughs> he's, he's not swatting at him. He is hitting Ali so hard in the body and Ali is just kind of like, yeah, take it, like, I'm just gonna kind of crush your head like this and, like, let you hit me. 
Um, I'm sure that hurt him. I'm sure he was getting worn down by it, but he didn't show it. So being able to not show it comes from being really, really strong. So um, if you're someone who doesn't like running, uh, you can think about it the way Jack Slack has said, which is he doesn't love running, but running allows him to do more karate. Like it gives him the uh, stamina to do more of what he really does like. Um, so if you have something that you have to do <laughs> that you're not super stoked on, remind yourself that it allows you to do the things that you are stoked on because there's a reason for all of the different strengths that people work on. All right, check if there are any last questions. All right, cool. Um, so uh, I have a free video on my YouTube channel, which is one of the last times I got to train with Andy Thompson, who was my mentor. He was a man who um, opened and ran Lana Muay Thai in the north of Thailand in Chiang Mai for decades. There are countless Westerners who owe their Thai experience and their whole like entry into Thailand and Muay Thai in Thailand to Andy Thompson. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away from a brain virus um, maybe two years ago. This was one of the last times that I saw him and got to work with him and Andy was this like mad scientist of the mountain who could like just keep learning and experimenting with things. He was really into this guy, Pavel, who probably um, a lot of Americans are familiar with. I think he lives in California now, but he's Russian. Um, and he's all into like body weight exercises and like stretches and all these different things. The dude is like, you know, uh, like old time strong men, that like farmer strong. Pavel's like that, Andy was like that. Um, in, <laughs> in Thailand to be like a little bit uh, slightly formal um, it's important that when you're a corner man, you have to wear long pants um, and usually like kind of a, a longish shirt. Um, tank tops, especially in the north of Thailand, which is more conservative, um, tank tops are a little bit on the edge of whether that would be appropriate to wear in certain situations. Um, Andy would like cut the sleeves off of his shirts and go in the corner to be like really proud of himself because he just had those fucking like shredded shoulder arms and he was in his uh, late 50s and 60s and he loved the way people would look at him and be like oh man that like that owner of Lana Muay Thai is just in good shape he was he was very very strong uh, he would do like one-legged um, squats and things like this so I have a video on YouTube that's Andy walking me through um, a series of things that require really almost no weights. Um, there are a few things that you can use weights for. Oh, there's actually like some sit-ups that he had me do with that. I don't think I can do that on my ball though. Um, but so you can watch that if you want some ideas, um, very good ideas from Andy. They will make you like super shredded and they're all kind of like slow, that like slow, so you use like every single muscle uh, for balance and things like that. That's really good. 
Um, I also mentioned Krongsak because he was on here for a minute. If you guys are interested uh, in seeing his um, patron session, he's in the Muay Thai library. Again, he beat Sagat three times, fought Diesel Noy twice. Super badass guy. Um, a lot of my uh, weight exercises and like conditioning type of stuff for me is just um, kind of for the for the confidence. Like <laughs> my uh, my brother, this this personal trainer and sports psychologist brother John, um, he was a wrestler in high school. Uh, wrestling. Those dudes just have, like, the strongest minds because wrestling training is just so, so hard. And uh, my brother John was advising me when I was getting ready for my first fight a million years ago in New York. <laughs> and uh, I had just been training with Master K. Like, I had had really, like, no sparring, no contact with anything. Like, I'd been hitting a bag and, like, uh, hitting Master K a little bit to his pads and things like this. And uh, I was running around a lake that was near our house. Uh, we lived up in Bear Mountain in New York, and I would just, like, run... Uh, to try to get my own conditioning going, because Master K is like, if you don't run, you can't do Muay Thai. And uh, my brother had told me that something he got from wrestling was that you have to train so that when you tell yourself, I know nobody trains as hard as I do, you believe that. Like, you fucking believe that the way you believe that your right arm moves when you tell it to. And I remember I was running around this lake and like the sun was setting and there were like geese on the pond and stuff and it, it was this part around the edge of the lake where it started to go on an incline. And I started to go up this incline and my legs were burning and I like just breathed out so hard to be able to like pull my legs higher so that I could get up the hill and I thought of my brother telling me, I know nobody trains as hard as I do and in that moment I believed it like in that moment it became very real for me and I started crying so I'm like sobbing as I'm running up this hill like nobody trains as hard as I do but when you actually believe it like when it becomes a truth for you in the way that like there are things that we doubt about ourselves and so we take things personally that other people say about us even if we don't know that person and we know that person doesn't know us but then there are some things people say that are just absolutely ridiculous because you know them not to be true. Like, um, if someone told me I was blonde, I know that not to be true, so I'm like, you're ridiculous. You can have that kind of belief in your body and in yourself where if someone's like, I'm stronger than you, I can laugh to the degree that someone telling me I'm blonde, I know that not to be true and be like, I know for a fact you're not stronger than me. <laughs> like, I know that. I know you do not train harder than me. So uh, find those things about yourself uh, that you absolutely believe and do the work to absolutely believe it. One of my favorite things that Andy used to say to me um, when I was getting ready to fight, um, it would be like my last day of training or something like that, and, and then you'd have the day of rest and then the fight the next day. Uh, as I was leaving the gym, Andy would be like, well, you've done all the work. Like, all the work is done. Don't have to think about it anymore. Now you just have to go fight. So do the work to convince yourself uh, and then be convinced of it. Like, like, do not doubt yourself on the things that you have earned for yourself because nobody can change those and nobody can um, take that from you, which I think is really cool. So thank you guys for watching day 22. Uh, if you want to see my normal at-home workout, um, there are lots of those in the first 21 days. Um, I am doing the elbows every day, doing the knees uh, on most days. I do a lot of high repetition. Weights is a little bit of um, a difference for me, but not because it's something that I don't uh, ever do, but something that I don't normally do. But it felt good. I was happy with that. I get to, I get to be the captain of my own ship and decide what I'm going to do on each day. So <laughs> thank you guys for your questions. Uh, look into the bare fist training. I think Kevin probably already posted a link because he's amazing at stuff like this. Um, but bare fist training uh, ties into what I was saying about Sifu yesterday. Someone asked me whether I still balanced on the basketballs. Um, that's the same thing of like building up all of those micro muscles for balance uh, in your ankles. Um, you can do that with your fists as well. So um, there are so many training ideas out there. They're just like endless, endless ideas. And uh, not only are they all over in the world, but there's like a gajillion ideas in the Muay Thai library. It's, it's, we call it a library for a reason. It's just like so much information. So if you're interested in that, um, you can check that out uh, as a patron. Um, and you can start out with whatever introduction you want to look at and see a few of the videos and see if it's something that you're really into and you can always uh, go up from there. But uh, $10 gets you the entire library and there's no way 
there's no way we could be in isolation long enough for you to even get through it. So um, have fun, stay safe, work on something, and uh, find your balance and confidence uh, in the processes that you put yourself through. Talk to you guys later.